Hey, so I want to talk a little bit about the light and dark sides of spiritual awakening, at least as it relates to the experience here, because there's no question that your experience is unique to you and will be the same in a lot of ways and very different in a lot of ways. And I can't ever really truly know or understand and vice versa. But <clears throat> I do spend a lot of time in contemplation, for better or worse. Because, of course, a lot of contemplating, a lot of thinking is not um, the immediately direct path to peace and non-disturbance. Again, when the mind is still, <clears throat> it's like the flat, glassy lake. When we start thinking, it's like throwing stones in it, it starts to splash and when you really start thinking a lot, it gets all wavy and chaotic. <clears throat> but interestingly and paradoxically, contemplating can also lead you to having realizations, it can allow you to connect the dots in your own mind, to gather information. It's so fascinating because it's like <clears throat> knowledge leads to wisdom the wisdom of letting go of knowledge. You use, you, you know, you gather up all this information <clears throat> so that you can, you know, put together coherent understandings which allow you th to then relinquish the knowledge because your understandings lead you to realize that knowledge limits you. But it's a balance that we strike because, uh, you know, while babies and invalids are arguably <clears throat> as close to God as you can get, they also can't wipe their own ass and can't function in society, can't even necessarily feed themselves. And, you know, <clears throat> It's all a dream, so they don't necessarily need to feed themselves, but uh, you know, it's like if belief has been established over lifetimes that you need to eat, then you're not gonna show up as a baby this next time around and be like, I don't need to eat anymore. I'm I'm enlightened. I was I, I reached enlightenment at the tail end of my last lifetime, so now this this lifetime I don't need to eat anymore. <clears throat> Maybe you can, but more likely than not, you got you know energies that are illusory and non-existent, and yet the mind is a powerful mechanism. And so you know to reach a place where we don't have to eat <clears throat> anymore requires a complete reconstruction of the dream. It's like I've talked about in other videos, it's like a butterfly effect. If you like tweak with one little thing, it affects everything. So it's not so much to just go, well, I can imagine anything. And so I'm just gonna do that. And you know, I'm gonna imagine that I can fly. Like in order to imagine you can fly and then, and then have it actually happen, you need to have, <clears throat> you need to be really, you know, um, transcended you need to be playing with your imagined self but knowing deeply that it's not you and being very connected with everything and everyone so that you can have others others be receptive to seeing you flying otherwise you're going to jump off a building <clears throat> and even if you think you're flying the rest of them are going to see you fall to the ground and splat I don't know. I'm, I'm just riffing right now. Let me get back to the topic. So, you know, <clears throat> the light and dark side of, of spiritual awakening, at least as I've experienced it, is, you know, it's paradoxically wonderful and amazing and, you know, totally, like, disappointing and dismal. And, you know, it's like, you're liberated from the prison 
of your mind, the prison of, you know, constraining yourself to a body, thinking yourself to be a body and being, you know, subject to the conditions of that. <clears throat> but you don't have a life anymore. <laughs> And so what it winds up leading you to is you realize that this is all about play, that everything is about play. We're just, we're playing, the, we're playing a game. And even once you realize you don't stop playing, in fact, you start playing better, more. But before we get into that, so what do I mean by the dark and light side? Well, you know, the light side is what I just shared. Like you realize that your body isn't a solid thing. It's a process. It's an ever changing, evolving, imagined thing that within the dream could be most well likened to like Well, there's, I didn't say most well, there's lots of things you can like to. I like to always compare it to a cloud, even though it's much more dense than a cloud. It's, it's just holographic and it's constantly changing and moving. So it's not really anything that you can pinpoint. You can't be like, I'm that. Because the moment you say I'm that, it's already turned into something else, just like a cloud. And, you know, it just happens very slowly or so we imagine, and it is much more dense, or so we imagine. But the only differentiators between a cloud and our body is that which we imagine. <clears throat> and the light side is that, you know, you can just live freely. You don't have to worry about being somebody, accomplishing something proving yourself, saving yourself, securing yourself, controlling the way things go, managing your reputation, all this crap that you never were able to do in the first place, which is what made it so awful trying to manage it. And, you know, but then <clears throat> you still have to play the game and kind of manage it you know you can't there are there are things that you've dreamed up about society standards again that you can't just go flipping off you can but you'll suffer the consequences unless you dissolve your own beliefs about them deeply enough that you don't suffer the consequences but your beliefs go deep and your mind's powerful so you can't just be like well i'm liberated i'm not actually the body and I'm not actually Andrew, so I'm just gonna walk into this store and take stuff off the shelf. Cause it's not real. And I'm just imagining all these people and these things. So it's my world and I'll just take whatever the fuck I want. Along with a first class ticket down to the jail cell. And that will happen. And you'll be like, why, what, what, why am I in jail now? What happened? I just, I should be able to manage my, imagine myself out of here. Like, well, sit on the cushion for a while in your jail cell and work on that one. We're going to undo in all the belief that led you to having, you know, this lifetime and, you know, arguably many others before uh, of cause and effect. Undo all that shit and then we'll, you know, maybe some have some miracle, miraculous walk through the wall or, you know, the jailer comes and lets you out. And it's not as though miracles don't happen like that, you know, now, but there's a lot of belief behind all of that. So anyway, the light side is that you know, you, you realize that you don't, you can't die, but you never lived and your body's going to, you know, evolve right on out, morph on out of this form into something else, but it's never been one solid thing. So you stop stressing, you calm down, you relax. It feels good. There's no more anxiety. There's no more fear. It takes some time to work on this and you have to train your mind and really, you know, think about it every day, contemplate about it, meditate on it. The more you do, the more relaxed you become the more fun you have with life because you're just playing a game, you know, and, and you know all the rules, so you play by them, but you bend them a little bit. You, you tease them a little bit. 
you get a little smirk on your face and people are like, oh my God, this is so awful. <laughs> because you know that it's actually you imagining that person bitching and complaining. And then it's, a, it's silly. There's nothing to complain about. There are no problems here. Just apparent problems. So that's the light side. Now for the dark side. <laughs> the dark side is the side that I like to lament about and, you know, go deep into and sit there with my wife and go, oh, God. You know, and I, uh, I'm, I'm not like a lot of spiritual people out there. Though I'd say I kind of liken myself to Alan Watts. Like, I'm a drinker. I don't drink heavy, but I have, you know, a drink almost every night, a beer, a glass of wine or a whiskey. And I'm thinking about curtailing that some though, because I do notice like I had a whiskey with dinner last night. I'm also a cook, I love to cook, love food. Uh, and somebody made a comment that they want me to start offering some of my personal story and how I, you know, kind of broke the dream. So I might go there. I haven't wanted to do that thus far because I'm not trying to make it about some imaginary character, Andrew. But I realized that offering story is a great way to point and relate and help people um, who are also on the, the path. I digress. Um, but I, you know, I have, I'll have a drink and it really depresses me. And it, it not always, but sometimes, especially whiskey. I, I like old fashions and I had one with dinner last night and, and then all of a sudden just sort of started making me moody and I can be a real moody asshole. Um, my wife has had to tolerate a lot of my bullshit. Um, and I'm a Virgo, so I'm very fussy. It doesn't necessarily mean you're fussy, but typically that's how Virgos are. And I'm very much like one textbook Virgo. And, uh, so I'm going to pause. So there you go. There's an example of how, you know, I'm still maybe a little bit trapped by my conditions of my superficial appearance because one of my neighbors came out of my building to walk their dog and I didn't want to have to get into explaining <clears throat> that I'm a YouTuber that does videos about non-existence because I have a suspicion that she has no idea about any of that and will it is not something I want to deal with so you know like <clears throat> there's that stuff that's kind of dark side stuff you know, you still have to kind of like decide which cans of worms you want to open up for yourself or not. You don't go home at Christmas and tell your parents that they're not real and you're just imagining them unless you want to deal with that. I sure don't. Eventually I will, but you kind of, you know, put a little drop of poison in their food drop a non-dual poison in their food <laughs> every so often, plant seeds, and eventually maybe they'll figure it out or they'll die first and, and you'll wash your hands of it. But uh, anyways, what the fuck was I saying? Um, I can't really recall, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna uh, just kind of stick with the dark side stuff. So, um, oh, I was talking about whiskey and how it you know depresses and sometimes and and it it kind of brought me down and i was uh you know in this just sort of somber mood and yet what was cool about it is it did bring out some you know some really nice insights and one of the things that was really hitting me is like you know by nature were habitual everything all all sort of living creatures are habitual you have to be <clears throat> because if you don't create habits you don't get anything done and your life is just a mess so you have to sort of create a routine for yourself to varying extent some people are more habitual and routine than others but you know ultimately we all get up and hopefully brush our teeth don't talk to me if you don't or keep your distance. Um, <clears throat> you know, 
make the coffee, go, you know, do whatever, whatever we do. I, I work out a couple times a week. I used to work out every single day and was all intense about it and, you know, trying to be jacked. And now I'm like, Psh, for who? But I guess for you, um, I'm still trying to stay fit and healthy to some degree. So today's my workout day. As soon as I'm done with this video, I'm gonna go work out. Um, <clears throat> but you create these habits you know, and I was thinking about living in different places and wherever you live, you like, you know, kind of create a routine and you have like places you like to shop, the grocery store you go to, even kind of the way you shop, the restaurants you like, uh, you know, if you have a partner, the routines, the shows you watch, the things you talk about, the way you are with them. But then inevitably the steamroller of life steamrolls it all over you like build up this really nice sandcastle in of habits and, and a life and you can't help but love it you're like i put so much work into this it's so nice look at how cool my sandcastle is everybody and they're like yeah what a great sandcastle congratulations i can't clap my hands because i'm holding the phone but you know and, and, and it, it feels so good and then bam <laughs> the waves come in and knock the whole fucking thing over and your partner leaves you and you lose your job and you're forced to move. You have to sell off a bunch of your shit, you know, or you just, you, you contract cancer or anything. Just all these damn unexpected infinite variables that interrupt your sweet little balance that you put together for yourself. And you create these patterns and you sort of establish this because it makes you feel comfortable and safe. You try to hold on to the known you try to create something that you can rely on because the unknown we all know is fucking unpredictable it's unknown and you know the whole goal i think or a big goal of spiritual waking awakening is to fall in love with the unknown is to realize that it's always unknown that you're not actually ever in the known it's just the illusion of the known but because it's such a slowed down effect life is so slow moving relatively speaking <clears throat> uh you know relative to other faster moving things or whatever but that you know you can create these routines and habits that allow you to sort of like you know get comfortable like right now like i've created this really comfortable routine of meditating and um and you know i didn't i didn't have that in past chapters of my life um <clears throat> And so I was a little, you know, buzzed on the whiskey and I was thinking about all this and I was just like, it's just so, there's just such a disappointing part to it because you realize that like, it's always gonna go like that. Like you, and you really have no choice. It's like the sand mandala. You're gonna spend all this time like the Buddhist monks, grain by grain, creating this beautiful mandala. And as soon as you're done, whew, you're gonna erase it. And that is just what's gonna be, how you doing? <clears throat> forever so you know settle in get comfortable with that um, master that because uh, you can try to go extreme with it and you know and detach and not have patterns and habits for yourself but like then good luck you know, paying your bills or good luck, like finishing a puzzle. Good luck having fresh breath. Good luck having a relationship. Um, but kiss it all goodbye. Just count on it. You lose it all. And I think we just love to have that experience. God, God actually loves to have disappointment. God loves to, um, you know, have the rug pulled out from underneath it. God loves to like, just, you know, become a master and then, you know, suddenly like get in a car accident and <clears throat> become a paraplegic. You're like, you become a, a yogi master or a Kung Fu master. And then, you know, you, you slip and fall in the kitchen and break your neck. <clears throat> not funny but kind of funny this is the dark side of spiritual awakening is is the or, or one of the dark sides <coughs> i'm sure you have others please share 
Um, but it's this understanding that what you thought you were doing, what you thought all this is, isn't what it is, but you have no choice but to keep playing along. Or kill yourself and then promptly reincarnate and have to just go through the lessons again in potentially a, you know, shittier form. That's relative. There's no such thing as shittier, but you know, if you've done all this work and you're well along the way, I mean, and then also like it's all preordained anyway, so you don't really have a say in it, but, but if you've done all this work, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've thought about committing suicide in the last year because everything has fallen apart for me, for me. And, <clears throat> And I, and I, you know, again, I've, I've shared, I take psychedelics and I've had these trips where I just like, I go all the way to the bottom. I reduce everything down to the, you know, to the infinitesimal and I'm, and I'm left realizing like, it's so meaningless. It's so pointless. There is literally no point to any of this. There's nothing. You don't end up getting anything out of it. There's not some grand ta-da. As soon as you have the ta-da, everybody like claps and leaves and goes home and goes on with their life. You know, I spend a lot of time thinking about <clears throat> just how quickly you're forgotten when people die. These people that are, that are being in your life, directly or indirectly, and they die. And, you know, if they're like really close to you, like if I lost my wife, she's my best friend, I'd be devastated. And it would be a long, arduous grieving. <clears throat> um, but, you know, then again, I'm also setting myself up. To, to understand that that's going to happen or I'll, or she'll lose me or whatever, but um, we'll lose each other. But like, you know, there's been some people that have, I, I actually lost a pretty close friend just a few months ago, <coughs> died in a motorcycle accident. And I mean, I don't know, you know, like hate me for it, but I haven't really felt too badly about him like I love the guy and I love spending time with him and he's a very sweet person very cool person very spiritually intellectual <clears throat> um, but not a seeker at all he just could sit and hang with the conversation and uh, you know and I hung out with him the day he died and um, <clears throat> excuse me uh, there's been some, you know, some sadness around it and I miss him, but like life goes on and I just simply can't sit and spend every moment of the day thinking about him. And I know he wouldn't want me to be, and you know, I've kind of celebrated him and it was your typical, like <clears throat> the family stepped in and wanted to wrangle everything and you know, I know that he basically told me he didn't want anything to do with his family, but we had to just kind of play along with that. And, uh, um, you know, so that's sort of the dark side because you, or, or another part of the dark side is that you, you see that like what actually happened there is just an apparition, just a cloud turned into vapor, disappeared. And, you know, arguably at some point, since we're unlimited, I could bring him back. We could bring him back. But, you know, the chances that we're going to do that <clears throat> anytime soon are unlikely, but that's a belief. Um, and so, you know, it's just like I said it in another video recently, and I like to use the metaphor. It's like, seeing behind the curtain like you thought the wizard of oz was this big deal and then you can't unsee what you see once you realize it's a little man on a stool with a megaphone and it all of a sudden occurs to you that like not knowing <clears throat> that ignorance was bliss not really though it wasn't bliss because you were terrified so now you're not terrified but you're like dang it was kind of fun how it scared me and now I'm not scared of now I have to fake it. I have to pretend like I'm scared. If I'm with other people and they're like, oh my God, can you hear that? It's, it's Oz. It's silly because we're not, we're not in 
Kansas anymore, Toto. We're not, we're not in that movie, but, but I'm metaphoring it. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> everybody else is acting scared. You have to play it along and you better get your, you know, Oscar award winning uh, mindset on. Because otherwise people are going to be like, I saw this video recently where Eckhart Tolle was talking about how these people were complaining to him about his suffering and he started to get a smirk on his face and they were like, what do you think this is funny? What's wrong with you? Why would you laugh about this? And then, you know, he had to sort of cover for himself <laughs> because like he could, he could potentially get punched in the face, even though it's him that would be punching himself in the face. Like, unless he's so mastered that he can be like, I am you sit down which would be a cool thing to have the, the power to do at some point, to be like, sit, and make an entire crowd sit. <laughs> Doubtful, and a very selfish, a very selfish attitude. It's an attitude of, you know, a small imaginary self wanting to have control over others. Fucking bullshit, but it's how we think. It's the kind of stuff we, we do and go through and then we awaken to and are humbled realize like why would I want to make other people sit when I am other people why am I trying to make it better for Andrew and you know not for someone else when I am everyone it starts to really get you to think about you know how you handle charity and how you handle treating others because <clears throat> You're still using this avatar. You still have to, you know, be a bit selfish. I think a lot of people will argue this, but I mean, this is the imaginary vessel that I'm using this time around. And, you know, like I said in another video recently, I'm like, if there's someone on the screen of your mind that's asking for help, help them because they're you. But it doesn't mean that you have to become a martyr. It doesn't mean that you, you know, suddenly go betraying yourself, making sacrifice. There are no ultimate sacrifices that need to be made. The, the real answer to it is, is expanding your consciousness. You know, instead of thinking that you need to like lessen your quality of living because other people around on the screen of your mind that are you have a lesser quality of living, Realize first that they're just imaginary, you're imaginary, they're providing contrast, they, they give the color to the painting. <clears throat> uh, you know, as unreal as it can seem, they disappear when you go away and vice versa. And, you know, then help to, to heal yourself because the more you heal yourself, the more it ripples out. And you stop reflecting these people who are struggling. And, you know, offer teaching. This is why teaching is important. It's a teach learn thing. We're all just teaching ourselves. We're all walking ourselves back home. I'm, I'm wearing a Ram Dass shirt right now. In fact, when you take off your mask, it's easier for everybody else to take off theirs. But you know, we're all just walking each other home. And so we're teaching our, our mind, all the points in our mind, which are all the people to awaken and flex their power to use their, their mind to, to sort out and heal their inside so that they're naturally reflecting a more beautiful picture outside, inside, outside, not real. It's all <clears throat> no side. And, uh, and so, you know, that's the ultimate approach. The, the greatest service you can do is to awaken. The greatest service you can do for others is to realize your true self, your true nature. And, uh, you know, you do more good for the world by sitting still and silent than you do with thousands of hours of community service and cleanup and, you know, donations and charity and whatever. <clears throat> if that doesn't make sense to you, let me know about it in the comments and I'll try to explain it because I'm going to wrap up now. Um, there are a lot more light and dark sides to spiritual awakening, but these are kind of two that, you know, I think overarchingly are relevant in what's perceived here. I'd love to hear your opinion and perspective, and I will certainly share more again soon.
Peace.